My name is Paul Webster, and I am Policy Director for Clean and Healthy New York and the co-leader of the Just Green Partnership. And thank you so much for joining our program this evening, Fatal Beauty, Toxic Chemicals in Personal Care Products, sponsored by the NAACP New York State Conference, the Just Green Partnership, Clean and Healthy New York, and we act for environmental justice. And um, we'll have our discussion. Um, we'll introduce our facilitator for the evening, who is uh, Mari Da Silva, the uh, chair of the New York State uh, Conference's uh, Environmental Justice Committee, and our five uh, speakers, uh, Natalie Patasaw, a uh, member of the NAACP and an adjunct professor of environmental sciences at Westchester Community College, Sonal Jessel, uh, my co-leader here with the Just Green Partnership and the policy director of We Act for Environmental Justice, uh, Kyle Conway, vice president of the Newburgh branch, NAACP, uh, Bobby Wilding, the executive director of the uh, Clean and Healthy New York, and Lindsay Dahl, the uh, Senior Vice President of Mission at Beauty Counter. And uh, at the end of the program, after the speakers, Mari will lead uh, the question and answer period. We're hoping to have a lively uh, session with that. We have a, a number of uh, groups and organizations that have signed up to participate tonight. Um, it's yeah, a, before you do that, Paul, sure. may I interject for a minute? Sure, I'd like to Go welcome ahead, everyone. Away. My name, on behalf of the NAACP New York State Conference, I'd like to welcome you to this wonderful, wonderful presentation entitled Fatal Beauty Toxic Chemicals in Personal Care Products. Um, I am the Environmental and Climate Justice Chair for the New York State NAACP, and I would like to welcome you as well. Is Dr. Dukes here yet? Because I know we'd like, uh, there she is, I think I see her. Um, I would like to introduce uh, our president of the NAACP New York State Conference, Dr. Hazel Dukes. She will offer a welcome. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can, Dr. Dukes, thank you. Good afternoon uh, for inviting me to um, say welcome to all the organizations uh, who have joined uh, this discussion, I think it's timely. I hope that uh, you can come away with some, some concrete solutions and not just about problems. Uh, we need to find solutions these days. We all know the problems. We know the environment justice that is in our communities. So congratulations to uh, those who have sponsored this evening and I wish you a very successful afternoon and to leave with, uh, again, with some solutions and how we uh, go through these challenges and journeys that is before us. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Dukes, uh, for your welcome address. Um, we will like to get started. Um, Paul, is there anything else you'd like to say at this point? No, we can uh, get, get started, Mari. Thanks. Okay, excellent, excellent. Our first presenter today uh, is going to be Natalie Patasaw. She is adjunct professor of environmental and science and sust sustainability for Westchester Community College. And she will speak for the next 10 minutes or so regarding PFAS. Go ahead, please. Good evening, everybody. It is such a pleasure to um, be able to participate in this program. Um, I've been teaching about um, uh, environmental pollution for, I don't know, maybe about 15, 18 years. After a while, you kind of forget the, the numbers of years. 
But I just want to give you a, a general introduction to what these PFAS chemicals are. Um, and PFAS are perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And they are high strength carbon fluorine, fluorine bonds in chemicals. And the properties are that they repel water and oil. There are, in the different reports that I have read, there are anywhere between 5,000 to 9,000 chemicals in this class. They are called forever chemicals because they don't break down. The body cannot metabolize it and they bioaccumulate, which means that they collect in the cells of the body and they stay there. And according to the EPA, there are about 600 of them in commercial use right now. Now you can get exposed to these chemicals um, through consumer products like Scotchgard water repellent. If you have clothing that repels water or furniture that repels water, excuse me. And that's uh, these PFAS chemicals are different, uh, actually a number of different subcategories. PFAS is the overall umbrella, so to speak. So Scotchgard is a PFOS chemical and it's also in wrinkle resistant clothing. Um, food packaging, you can get exposure from that, particularly if you have paper types of food containers like takeout food, or often I hear reports talking about popcorn packages, you know, like a, the popcorn bags you put in your microwave. Think about it. They line those containers with um, uh, this PFAS coating because, you know, they often have... Um, butter and oil in them and you don't want that to leak out. So this coating repels that and keeps the quote unquote butter or the oil inside of the package. Um, it's also uh, in firefighting foam. I was on a uh, webinar, yeah, like a conference um, a number of months ago by the Environmental Working Group and they had a um, president of a national firefighters union. And he talked about that exposure um, because they use this all of the time if they're using firefighting foam. It's also in things like your nonstick cookware and that type of uh, PFAS is called PFOA. Um, so anything that has a nonstick coating to it, of course, has this um, material in it, this chemical. Um, and you also get increased likelihood of exposure if you live near an airport, if you live near certain types of military installations and industrial manufacturing sites. This um, PFAS can also be inhaled in dust form. And according to some of the reports, that's one of the ways that um, children get their uh, main exposure into their systems. So what are the problems with this? There are numerous health impacts. And according to the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which is part of the um, CDC, the Center for Disease Control, um, you can, it, it exacerbates uh, testicular and kidney cancer your liver damage, and think about this, the kidneys and the, and the liver are the organs that purify your blood and take the toxins out of your body and pass them out of your system. It decreases antibody response to vaccines. This is so critical right now because we are in a pandemic. They're talking about another variant, Omicron. And um, you know what is the uh, efficacy of the current vaccines, do we need new vaccines? Do we need to get booster shots? There's a lot of discussion about this. Um, it also increases cholesterol. We all know the implications of that. High cholesterol, it clogs your body, you could have strokes. You, sometimes the first indication that you have high cholesterol is you die from a massive stroke. Um, it, increase, it might increase uh, thyroid disease. 
pregnancy-induced hypertension and preeclampsia, which threatens the unborn child as well as the mother. Um, it decreases a person's fertility and it also might cause low weight, low birth weight babies. So there are lots of reasons for us to be very concerned about the exposure to this chemical or this class of chemicals. Now, just to give you a little good news, um, it's, it's certain industries, textile industries are beginning to see that people don't want this, it's very harmful. And Ikea and Levi's clothing have phased out PFAS in their textiles. Um, certain jurisdictions, certain states and cities um, and, and countries are banning the um, PFAS in their paper-based food packaging. And that's going on in the state of Maine, in the state of Washington, not Washington DC, but in the state of Washington, in San Francisco, in California, and the country of Denmark. So all of those places have banned them from, um, from paper-based food packaging, which I think is fabulous. Um, it's a national water quality problem as well. For example, in um, I happen to live in, in Rothland County. We only get our water from within the county. We cannot tap into other water supplies like uh, you know, the New York City watershed. So we have to be very mindful. It has been um, detected in low levels in Rockland County. There are other places like Newburgh, Kyle will talk about that, and Hoosick Falls. Matter of fact, Hoosick Falls got a $65 million settlement from the DuPont Company for the contamination to their water supply. So there's lots of different um, aspects of this that we really need to be aware of. It's also, um, uh, let me see. I'm sorry, I'm just checking my notes here. Though this is, the, this is really one of the big issues. It's gone largely unnoticed by the general public. People don't know about this. And um, there are so many different um, parts of the country that have contaminated water. The Environmental Working Group did a, actually they have an interactive website. If you go on their uh, page and, or in their site rather, and in that um, site, on that site, uh, let me tell you what I found out. In 2015, they did a study from 2013 to 2015, a little bit dated, right? But they tracked six different PFAS chemicals and they found them in 194 water systems around the country that service 16 million people, that people are drinking this and they're not aware. And um, again, the, the main um, ways that you know about this, if you look on that map, is there near industrial sites, military um, firefighting uh, locations and airports. But they updated this interactive website. And in March, 2019, they found it in 610 locations in 43 different states that have 40, 400, I'm sorry, 446 water systems and 117 military sites. So we can see that this is ubiquitous. Um, uh, another report that I read said that everybody's got some amount of this PFAS chemical in their body. So there are lots of reasons for us to um, be aware of this and to, be, and to organize ourselves and do something about it. There are also, um, this is really something else. It's in cosmetics, as you know. And in the cosmetics, I was reading a report um, that said that it's in, listen to this, 
the Environmental Science and Technology, which is a, a scientific journal that is um, put out by Yale University. They've been, this organization has been around for like 50 years putting out um, journal articles, which means that other scientists have double checked over the, um, the research before it's even published. Totally different from doing a Google search, all right? And um, so anyway, they screened 231 cosmetic products across eight different makeup categories. And they have found this in mascara, concealers, foundations, lipsticks and powders, as well as eyebrow pencils and other things. And the foundations have fluorine in them, which when you find fluorine in a product, that's a precursor to the PFAS, the F for the fluorine, in 63% of them. And one of the reasons, if, if this makeup that you're using says it um, is long lasting and um, it's, you know, where you can wear it all day, those kinds of, ter that terminology, that is an indication also that it's got PFAS in it because that's what um, has it. L'Oreal, Ulta, CoverGirl, Clinique, Maybelline, the list goes on and on. So there are a lot of, there's a lot more information, but I don't want to um, take up too much time on this because I know that there is a, one of our panelists will talk very specifically about the makeup. So thank you very much for allowing me to um, bring that information to the fore. The next person can go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Natalie. Uh, Sonal, do you want to go? Yes, I can. Um, thank you. That was that was a very helpful <laughs> overview. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to add to this conversation by specifically talking about race when it comes to exposure to PFAS, particularly exposure to toxic chemicals and beauty products. Um, I'm going to share my screen quickly since I have some visuals for everybody. I like visuals. Uh, so my name is Sonal Jessel. I'm the director of policy at We Act for Environmental Justice and the co-chair of the Just Green Partnership, which is hosting this event tonight, um, co-hosting this event tonight. And just so everyone understands We Act, um, if you haven't heard of our organization before, we are a community-based organization based in Harlem. We started in 1988 when our um, founders were protesting an act of environmental racism in Harlem where a sewage treatment plant was being placed in the neighborhood um, on the west side of Harlem and it was spewing all sorts of nasty pollutants and it, apparently it smelled really terrible. And it was um, one of the big issues was that this was cumulative, right? This, this, um, this act of putting this environmentally hazardous industrial site was being placed in a neighborhood that already had nine out of the 10 polluting bus depots in Manhattan that already had a lot of other sources of environmental hazards. And um, Harlem at the time had very high rates of, of asthma and other um, health issues that come as a result of environmental uh, hazard exposure. So that's how we got started in this. This is the work that we still do. We work um, around policy, environmental health research, education, around um, addressing environmental justice issues. Um, so what we're talking about today here is the idea of environmental health, which um, is a huge motivator for the work that WEACT does. We always think about everything in the lens of health uh, because that is what we are ultimately working for is that communities of color and lower income communities deserve to live in a healthy neighborhood where they can work, play, pray, and learn in healthy environments. And so when we, the work that we do around toxic chemicals and PFAS as one of them is because there are so many lasting health impacts um, from these chemicals that as, as we just heard um, are, are very dangerous for the health and well-being of, of people. 
we can skip that one. So We Act has a campaign that we call Beauty Inside Out. And this campaign was started as a response to the fact that uh, cosmetics, particularly cosmetics that contain toxic chemicals such as PFAS, are disproportionately marketed and used by women of color. Um, and the, and um, so a, a research study found that African-American consumers purchase nine times more what they call ethnic hair and beauty products more than any other groups. And um, they, uh, Latina communities are also the fastest growing market for this as well. So their rates of purchasing these products and using these products is, is going up really heavily as well as Asian Americans who spend 70% more than the national average on skincare products. And not to mention that all of these um, communities of color are using and exposed to more of these products, but they're also the ones that are more likely to be actually creating the products, working in the um, industry and doing the manufacturing work. Even nail salon technicians is part of this conversation um, and when it comes to toxic exposure. And this industry is worth, uh, the number I have is $200 billion a year. So this is a lot of money that is um, uh, gained by uh, particularly advertising to communities of color. I'll say from, from my own personal perspective, like South Asian women uh, disproportionately use a lot of skin lightening products because of the standard of lighter skin being the, the more beautiful idea and right and so these types of values lead to a high usage of toxic products that might contain these chemicals. Um, skin lightening cream, for example, contains mercury. Um, so this is just a chart here that shows um, uh, some of the examples of the ways that the um, sort of the, the beauty standards are leading to use of chemicals and products that are, that are toxic and, and how they harm our health. Um, this is a problem that's very pervasive. Um, it exists across so many different companies, so many, um, even across the world, this is a major problem. And um, there's just not enough done to address the fact that, that these products and cosmetics particularly contain all sorts of chemicals, PFAS being one of the big ones that is disproportionately used by women of color um, and it's marketed towards women of color. So one really good example of this is the recent um, conversation around Johnson & Johnson's baby powder. They just got, um, you know, had to go through a really major lawsuit because their talc powder actually is carcinogenic. And there's evidence that showed that they were specifically marketing in African-American communities to use this product, knowing, knowing how toxic it is for people's health. Um, so that's just one example, but this is a problem that's pervasive across the whole industry. And so um, we're gonna have someone else talk about what the solutions are, but to us, you know, the, the capability to buy chemical, buy cosmetics that are full of toxic chemicals should not even be an option. That's really where we're going with all of this is um, there is a there is a major injustice in the fact that people who are exposed to cumulative environmental hazards, so not only chemicals through toxic, uh, chemicals through cosmetics, but through food, um, through, you know, household furniture, um, through being living in a community that has other environmental hazards and industrial sites, these chemical, these, these cumulative exposures to toxic products is the big problem that we're talking about here. And it is acts of environmental racism. And that's, that's why we work on it. I believe that's it for me and I'll pass it on to the next speaker, but we have our, our campaign and that we're working on if anyone is interested in, in reading about it, but ultimately we're working on this issue through the Just Green Partnership, which we'll hear more about soon. So thank you. All right. And our next speaker is Kyle.
Hello? Does everyone hear me? Yes. Beautiful. Um, good evening. I am Kyle Conway. I am the first vice president of the Newburgh Highland Falls branch of the uh, NAACP. I am also the, the chair of the Environmental Justice Committee. Um, what's going on in Newburgh is interesting, it's exciting. Um, and we're trying to be one of the, the, the champions and leaders of change when it comes to environmental uh, justice. <clears throat> what's going on in Newburgh, there has been, there was an exposure it was discovered that there was um, PFAS exposure in the drinking water back in 2016. The immediately uh, the government sought to resolve the issue by tapping into New York City's um, aqueduct instead of the local drinking um, source, which was the which was the um, Washington Lake and the Brown Pond. Uh, it was contaminated through Stewart Airport, then through the National Guard's use of the um, fire extinguishing um, chem PFAS found in the um, in the fire extinguishing chemical, and they uh, they used it so often, it ended up it's it's soaked into the ground and which eventually soaked into uh, a stream which led into Washington Lake. <clears throat> there was actually a, a um, I believe there was a, there was an accident um, on Estuary Airport in like 1990, and there was so much of it used. Um, they're still debating on exactly when, or what, what, exactly what caused the, that level of toxicity in the water, but it's, we know that it's, the exposure has been for decades. Um, <clears throat> so in 2016 was, was when this was discovered, there was a, you know, the city was in an emergency. They transferred the water source, drinking water source, and there was testing done. The issue with the testing that was done was there really wasn't anything done with that particular information. Um, this time around, uh, the NAACP is involved with the with the RAC or the RAB, which is Stewart's Airport's Restoration Advisory Committee is just been elevated to a restoration advisory board because now it's receiving funding to remediate the PFAS issue at the airport. Uh, they're trying to clean up the area at the airport and they're looking into uh, mitigating and eventually resolving how to extract the PFAS from the, the drinking water source, but which is a very expensive uh, endeavor. Um, I've been frequently um, attending these meetings. I'm actually looking into joining the, the Restoration Advisory Board. And so the NAACP is always has an ear to <clears throat> exactly what's going on and, um, and how can we also help offer solutions. Now that the board has been, the, the advisory committee has been funded and the situation is being rectified at the, at the airport level or at the source, um, the NWCP is ensuring that, or wants to ensure, and is participating to ensure that the people are serviced. And how is this done? We are, we are participating in a national study with, uh, with Dr. Bell, uh, there are seven sites nationally. Um, Dr. Bell uh, is partnering with a national organization, I'm forgetting at the moment, and on um, New York State um, Department of Health. There are seven sites nationally. The two of the sites are Hoosie Falls in upstate New York and Newburgh, New York. What they're going to do in Newburgh is, is test 700 people, 500 adults, 200 children. Through the data, um, we want to see how, to what, to what degree people are affected, and make sure people know their results. And we want to advocate for their health. And this is when we will um, use this data and to try to 
help impact um, legislation or or just bring bring awareness to what is going on. We just spoke to we, there was just a meeting right before um, this presentation. Um, there were several organizational organizations that came together. Um, we had Riverkeeper um, was a clean water project. Uh, New York um, Environmental Advocates for New York. Um, we actually had a local um, clinic come into this meeting so to help address what solutions could take place. Because when we find the data, the goal is to have a local clinic help service the people. Um, <clears throat> and if there could be litigation that addresses the the PFAS issue at the local level and at the state level and at the national level. Besides, um, besides the the banding of products, which was already discussed, um, the use of the chemical in products, excuse me. Um, but to to really address the funding that is necessary to either uh, remediate the environments and areas of the environment that are impacted, again attempting to clean the the areas or providing a health service because there once the chemical is within your system it is it is <clears throat> you're, you're going to be impacted there are several cases of besides besides health um, impacts that have have been seen in Newburgh there have been sites of um um cited of testicular cancer Kidney failure, um, thyroid issues, which is really common with having um with PFAS. Uh, besides the health issue that's been impacted in Newburgh, it's also um, impacted Newburgh uh, economically, where people are scared to invest in Newburgh because they believe the drinking the water source is um, tainted. Even though we are tapped into <laughs> the New York City's aqueduct, so the water is just fine. Actually, I, I took a tour of the, the water plant and uh, seeing what they do in their process, they're definitely keeping the people safe. Part of the testing, uh, just a little side note, that uh, Dr. Bell and um, this multi-site study is going to investigate is the lead in the in the, in the piping. And, and so they were also going to see if that's an issue as well. So <clears throat> that's, that's what the multi-site study is uh, seeking to, to discover. So what's going on in Newburgh is um, we understand the history of PFAS, what is, is people have been impacted over the decades. Um, there's, a, there's a group that's coming together seeking to resolve the issue and moving forward. Um, the one thing we're certainly doing is right now we're seeking to have data and from the data we can definitely see where we can go to address the PFAS issue and how to provide solutions. We can't really provide solutions until we know specifically. And yes, it's, there's been testing before, but interestingly, and I'm actually trying to figure out, because I've, I've asked people who've, um, who've been around, who remember being tested, and even though it's public record, the people were not aware of their, this is what's been discussed over in, that, in over several interviews I've had, and, um, and also my colleagues and other organizations, that people were not made aware of their um, health status or exactly how much PFAS was in their system. Um, but again, that's, I don't know if that's an oral history, if that's exact. So moving forward, there's another study. And with the data, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to have a base where to address um, the issues. Also that, that, that test that was um, given, there was, um, and again, that's, there's also mixed information and I've, Done my own research. Um, uh, fifty-nine participants, uh, fifty-nine people participated in the study, but the city of Newburgh has twenty-nine thousand people. So, this test uh, that that the NAACP is partnering with Dr. Bell in his uh, multi-site study is to ensure that that these numbers, five seven hundred people, are reached. Um, and when we can address this, we can certainly address the multi we can address the, the determinants of health in Newburgh. And that's part of the, our goal as, as this in, in Newburgh is to 
address all the all the determinants of health. You know, if you if the environment is not healthy, the people aren't healthy. If um people are not educated, people are not uh, financially put in positions to prosper, you're really not gonna have a healthy community. So, the, you know, that's that's definitely one of our main um main concerns in Newburgh. So that's uh essentially I just wanted to give a give a um a synopsis of what's going on. It's busy work. Um but we are definitely here to serve the people and we we're very active and we're active with other organizations <clears throat> in in Newburgh and also in, in neighboring towns as well. Um we are we're addressing not just the water issue but any fracking issues in the in the neighborhood that would um impact the people as well. So that's my that's my tidbit. Thanks so much, Kyle. Lindsay? Unmute. Hey, everyone. Hi, we're good now. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lindsay Dahl, and I lead the mission team at Beauty Counter, which is a skincare and cosmetics company focused on creating the cleanest formulas um, possible, which we're going to talk about how that's challenging and also the work that we do um, to incorporate what we heard about earlier from the other panelists, um, a lot of the racial inequities that currently exist and how people approach formulating beauty products in the beauty industry and what Beauty Counter is doing to use our business voice to help try to change the system. So um, that's what I'm gonna walk through. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and I've just got a few slides. I'll quick share uh, my screen to help create a little bit of visuals. Um, so can everyone see my screen okay? Okay, cool. So as I mentioned, um, Beauty Counter is based in Southern California. We sell across the United States and in Canada. And our mission is to get safer products into the hands of everyone. And um, we intentionally mean all products safer, not just Beauty Counter's um, products into the hands of everyone. And there's a reason for that. So we um, we started eight years ago, eight and a half years. I've been with a business. I used to be in DC working on policy um, reform on issues like related to PFAS chemicals. And so when I transitioned from the nonprofit to the private sector, um, one thing we were talking about earlier today is I hadn't quite realized just how hard it is to actually main, make clean products. So I want to walk you through the steps we take um, and our approach to transparency when it comes to bringing products to the market that, number one, meet the needs of consumers um, while also protecting our health because we don't feel like you need to compromise your health um, to take a shower in the morning, for example. So um, if you think about traditional risk assessments that think about and decide what is safe, we hear all the time in the beauty industry, um, oh, but that's safe. That's just a little bit. That doesn't matter. Um, the question is safe for who? And so that's the, the premise of using decades worth of peer reviewed research that we have built this company on. And our approach to safety um, addresses a few different things that I wanna walk through. So first we have what's called our never list. It's a list of over 1800 ingredients um, and classes of chemical, including those fluorinated compounds and PFOS chemicals that we heard about earlier um, that are banned and restricted from our products. So the one thing I've learned is that banning ingredients is the easy part. Um, making sure your formulations are actually clean is even more challenging. Um, so after we ban those ingredients, we go on to screen every ingredient for safety, screening against 23 health and environmental endpoints. And the key here is that we're screening for number one, real world exposures. So as we heard about earlier, um, if you think about salon workers, they are exposed at higher rates um, and higher levels to certain chemicals and beauty products um, than other people. And so we're screening for how people actually use our products in real life. And we're also considering vulnerable populations. And so um, based on the science that includes BIPOC communities, communities of color, um, pregnant women and children. And the, the importance of doing so is that it helps us address that question, 
who is this product safe for? Because oftentimes when companies are formulating, especially in the beauty industry, they're not considering different vulnerable or overexposed communities. And so that's baked into the DNA and the approach of how we um, tackle safety at Beauty Counter. And we also are doing things like we're screening every batch of color cosmetics for a suite of heavy metals, which will never appear on the ingredient list when you're shopping the marketplace, but are particularly of concern for products that have more pigments in them, um, including kind of bright reds and pinks and um, different shades of foundations that are um, designed to meet the needs of diverse skin tones. And so understanding the importance of screening for contaminants like heavy metals uh, across color cosmetics is something that's really important and is part of our approach to how we define safety at, at Beauty Counter. So what we always like to say is that true safety is only possible with supply chain transparency. And so I'm gonna describe what I mean by that. Um, as I mentioned, banning ingredients is the easy part. We're talking about PFAS as kind of a through line of today's conversation. Um, so fluorinated compounds are restricted um, at beauty counter and um, they're also found widely across our supply chain. And so there's other examples of this, whether it's heavy metals or it's classes of chemicals like phthalates, there are these contaminants that um, impact in are in manufacturing equipment. They are in the barrels that ship raw materials across the globe um, before they ever make their way into a beauty product. And sometimes they're intentionally used to treat raw materials like a pigment that would make a lipstick really beautiful. Um, but when you're a manufacturer like Beauty Counter, maybe you're buying that beautiful red pigment and you don't know that it's been treated with fluorinated compounds because they don't have to tell you anything. And so this gets to what I'm gonna close with, which is um, why Beauty Counter is working so hard to use our voice um, to advocate for more supply chain transparency because manufacturers have to ask harder questions. They have to do the hard work themselves, and that includes spending a lot of time and money testing. Um, but it's hard to do that when your supply chain is not being transparent with you. So um, I want to talk about a couple other areas and ways in which we're incorporating um, environmental justice into the design of our products, because it's important. It's not just about the ingredients on the inside. It's also about the packaging. Um, and so we try to source uh, packaging that is not only more sustainable, um, but also screens that those packaging materials for toxic chemicals, which is important, especially for communities where those chemicals and where that packaging is made. Uh, we also have a responsible sourcing program to make sure that products are not just safe for us when we use them in the morning, but also safe from a human rights perspective um, across our supply chain. And we've also taken a vocal stance um, working for climate justice. And we have a goal to be carbon neutral by 2030, and we're implementing programs to help us achieve that goal. Knowing that it's on us as a company, not only to make safer products, but also to be accountable for the externalities, including carbon pollution that we are putting out into the world. Two final things and then we'll wrap up. Um, we also like to support organizations that we partner with and we think are leading the way, um, including some of which you may be familiar with, Black Women for Wellness um, and Agents for Change, which are working, um, you know, we've worked really closely with organizations like the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative and Black Women for Wellness in our advocacy work. So um, as I mentioned, you know, it's not enough just to create safer products and try to push the supply chain. We really feel like it's important for our business to have an active presence, both in state legislatures, as well as in DC, asking for supply chain transparency, asking for our industry to be regulated. We've been very outspoken about this since we started and we mobilize our community to show up to say, guess what? We work in the beauty industry. We think it's the right thing to do um, to hold the industry accountable because we really see it as the path forward um, to creating safer products. And so we've partnered with a lot of leading organizations um, to both pass legislation in DC, but also at, um, in state legislatures, including the state of New York. Um, but a couple of examples would be, we helped pass the Safer Salon Bill here in the state of California, where we partnered um, and advocated for more transparency for salon workers who are, as we mentioned, overexposed and the clients that are um, receiving those treatments as well, including hair straightening treatments, um, nail salon technicians, et cetera. 
Uh, we've also helped pass the Cleaning Products um, Right to Know Act uh, several years ago in partnership with a lot of different organizations and companies. Again, creating more transparency for workers and holding um, the cleaning industry accountable for transparency, that's really critical. And then we've also been trying to use our business to educate members of Congress. And so a few years ago, we had scientists on Capitol Hill that were educating congressional staff on the science behind the impacts to communities of color, um, specifically around beauty products and what does the science tell us and how should it inform how we create laws and pass policies to protect people. Um, so in closing, um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, you know, I think the, the take home message is that we, um, we don't have all the answers, um, but we're doing what we can as a business to really ask hard questions when we're formulating our products. We're asking hard questions of our suppliers, even if they're not being as transparent with us as we like. And we're also asking um, our elected officials to respond to the need um, for safer products. And that's not just gonna be led by the business community. Um, it has to, we need to have laws that make it, so it doesn't matter who you are, how much time you have to research products or how much money you have, you should be able to go into, a pro into any store and know that the product is safe. Um, and so uh, we're doing what we can to be agents of change within the industry. Um, that is wildly outdated. Um, and we can already see the momentum that collectively with so many of you on the phone, um, we've, we've been able to make. So um, I'll stop there and I'm looking forward to the next speaker and to our Q&A. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay. Hi, uh, everybody. I'm Bobby Wilding. I'm the executive director for Clean and Healthy New York. And uh, we have the privilege, along with We Act for Environmental Justice, of co leading a Just Green Partnership, which is a, it's now about almost 15 years old. Uh, and this coalition is stood together working for environmental health and justice for New York's people and communities. Clean and Healthy New York ourselves, our mission is to build a just and healthy world where toxic chemicals are simply unthinkable. And so we apply that in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm really uh, honored to be in this uh, great group of speakers tonight. Um, and I really want to thank the NAACP and President Dukes for hosting this. And Mari, I want to give you a shout out. Thank you so much for all of your work in making this happen. Um, and thank you to all of the speakers uh, again. So I, I wanna sort of try to pull some of this together and talk about what we can do here in New York together to make change. And Lindsay queued this up nicely with um, what Beauty Counter and how they're engaging in policy. Um, I was actually just on a, a conference with a number of business and environmental leaders called BizNGO. Uh, and the, the panel discussion right before this, uh, was about transparency in the supply chain and um, talking specifically about some of the policy that's moving at the federal level to, to prompt transparency in the personal care supply chain. Um, so this is a really important topic and you know why we focus on personal care is of course, because it's the, those are the products that all of us are most intimately exposed to, right? We're directly choosing to put them on our bodies every day. Um, but I just sort of want to think for a minute and take a step back to think about the cumulative impact of, of personal care products, right? First, you have the, the synthesizers of the chemicals and the people who, the, the companies that extract those raw materials from the earth. Then it goes through all those different layers that Lindsay was talking about, where it's being uh, manufactured or, or PFAS is showing up in the supply chain because one manufacturer or another of a different component is using it in their manufacturing facilities. It ends up in our products, right? And then uh, sometimes we wash it down the drain if we're washing the pe personal care products off our bodies. Uh, it, if we're throwing a bottle into the garbage that could end up in a landfill, uh, it could end up being incinerated and getting into our air. Um, and so contaminating those uh, uh, environmental factors for us locally. But then we also heard earlier today at this conference, virtual conference I was at, um, about the way in which these chemicals actually get transported globally and they end up in the Arctic. Um, and so environmental justice organizers from Alaska were sharing stories about the ways in which 
they're not using many of these chemicals, but they're ending up in their bodies because of this global transport. So we're really all connected here um, and really interconnected. Uh, and the issues that we're working on really are cumulative because of course, it's not just our personal care products. As Kyle was describing, the PFAS that's contaminating the water supply in Newburgh comes from uh, use of PFAS in firefighting foam. Um, Natalie talked earlier about um, PFAS being banned in our uh, uh, the the single use uh, food packaging that's actually been passed here in New York as well. We've banned that. Uh, it'll be going into effect next year. Um, and so, what we're looking to move forward on next is a bill uh, to ban to to require supply chain disclosure to give us information about what's in personal care products, whether it was added intentionally but also to push companies and give companies the, the backing of New York State to be able to demand from their supply chain information about potential contaminants. Um, because it's not just enough to know what was intended to go in the bottle. Um, it's also really critical to know what came along for the ride. Um, and so we've got a bill, it's sponsored by Senator Rivera in the Senate and uh, Assemblyman Gottfried. Um, and, it's gonna require disclosure of all of those ingredients, including fragrances, including colors, which companies have tried to hold as proprietary and didn't wanna tell us for many, many years, still push back hard against that. Um, it's gonna require companies to identify which of these chemicals appear on lists of chemicals of concern. And what that does for us is, I mean, I have an environmental science background. I've been doing this work for 25 years. And uh, I still don't know all of the different chemicals and their name. They're complicated. It's a very specific deliberate language that was written by scientists for scientists. So when we require companies to disclose not only what the ingredient is, but whether or not it's on a list of chemicals of concern, we as ordinary mortals can go and actually understand whether or not these are problematic. What that does also is it makes companies like Beauty Counter that are avoiding toxic chemicals clearly stand out. So you can actually identify the companies and the products that are doing better. Um, and then it also includes um, a restriction on a group of chemicals, including heavy metals like lead um, and PFAS chemicals. So we're gonna take action on the worst chemicals to get them out of products sold in New York. And we know that when New York state takes action, it has a huge ripple effect across the whole economy for, for the country. Um, and so, you know, Lindsay alluded to a number of the places that PFAS still shows up. Um, I, I want to say that we know that this is a challenge for the, the green beauty industry. Um, and just really briefly, I want to just share a couple of um, websites with you. Um, so just forgive me while the shift happens. Um, but uh, if we look at um, this... <laughs> great organization, Momovation. I want to give a shout out to Leah Segedy, who's on the line tonight. Um, she's been testing products for PFAS and doing research on um, toxics in um, a number of consumer products. And she recently looked at the green beauty industry. And what she found was that 65% uh, of the products that they tested for organic fluorine, so in markers for PFAS, they found contamination. And this is among a group of, in, of products where it wasn't on the label at all. And it's a follow-up to research that was done earlier this year that uh, found that use of PFAS in cosmetics was widespread. And in more com common commercial brands, 8% uh, of the products that they looked at actually had PFAS chemicals on the label. So this is where um, Natalie was talking earlier about, um, you know, the, the long wear makeup or the, you know, this, you know, no run mascara. Um, but even when it wasn't intentionally on the label, it was also a problem in, in conventional products as well. So we know that there's an issue and we know that it has to do with the supply chain. Um, and we also know that PFAS is just going to be the start, right? This is just one group of chemicals. Um, that we have to worry about. So it's really critical that we start getting this information and New York can really lead the way in that. I, I do wanna say there's also a suite of four bills that are being, uh, have been introduced by um, uh, Stokowski in, the, in Congress. 
that also address the supply chain and pushing that information federally. Um, we think that New York can help play a role in that, uh, making that change by moving in our bill here in New York State. Um, and just to just draw the line back to how New York manufacturing plays a role here, um, the one of the first communities that we knew was contaminated by, by PFAS chemicals is Hoosick Falls. And it turns out that what they're making there, one of the product lines that they make there is um, a fiberglass textile that's coated with PFAS. And you can sometimes buy this in craft stores to be like a cutting board for certain craft projects because it's nonstick, but it's also widely used in manufacturing. And so it's highly likely that some of this product that's being made in Hoosick Falls is going off to those manufacturing facilities. The products that are being made that come into contact with that are picking up the PFAS and it's ending up showing up in the product testing like what we're seeing um, here in personal care products. So there's a really a loop and we really, as we tackle and talk about the products, we also have that connection back to all of those manufacturing communities that we change when we start restricting chemicals in final products. And I think that's really, um, it's, it's really important. And it's also the reason why here in New York, um, we act as actually one of the leading organizations that's advancing a couple of different bills, including just the Just Green Partnership supporting um, to address cumulative impact so that we know that all these different exposures um, add on top and multiply with one another and that communities deserve and have the right to have a say about um, what comes into their communities that adds to their burden. And so that's, we, we will be moving that as well. We really believe that there's a strong role for the NAACP to be a change maker here. Um, we know that when we bring together um, people uh, and different kinds of organizations, we can really have a huge impact. Just as a great example, in 2021, last session, we were able to win a, a bill called the Family and Firefighter Protection Act that acts on huge classes of chemicals that are used as flame retardants. Sounds like it would be good, but the A, they don't really work as flame retardants and B, they're toxic all the time, um, particularly to children and when they burn, they're toxic to firefighters. Um, and that was possible because of partnerships with firefighters, environmental health and justice organizers and organizations within Just Green and the NAACP. Y'all were critical in the unanimous vote uh, that happened in both houses. Um, and so I really hope that we can talk about ongoing ways that we can collaborate um, and uh, make a huge difference. And at that, with that, I am going to stop and uh, turn it back over to our facilitators to have a QA. and a Thank you, Bobby. And uh, Mari, are you uh, ready to start the question and answer period? Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, hold on, please. I certainly would like to thank all of our pre presenters. This has been extremely informative. Um, Ms. Dahl, why is your company so different? And why aren't other companies transparent about their ingredients? And also, could you possibly, at maybe at some point, uh, provide us a, with um, a list of some of these chem chemicals and um, how they impact the body? Um, go ahead, please. Can you hear sure. me? Yeah, I can hear you. And um, thank you for the question. I will put a link in the chat that gives you kind of a, I would say a hit list or some of the top offenders that are found in the beauty industry. Your question's a big one, so I'll be as short as I can in answering it. I think there's the main reason that, there's two reasons that not every company is doing the hard work. Number one, mm -hmm. it's really expensive. 
And number two, they're not required to, which gets to why we feel like there needs to be better oversight and regulation of our industry to hold the industry accountable because we've seen for decades now what an virtually or lightly regulated beauty industry looks like. And it's not working. The industry without regulations is still making the same products they made decades ago. They're not asking hard questions about the safety of ingredients put in the products um, that they're putting out into the marketplace and are not held accountable when problems are found. Like in um, one of the speakers had the headline, Bobby, around asbestos. I think maybe it was you, but I can't remember. But anyway, asbestos was found in children's makeup and the FDA couldn't do anything about it. So, um, but I think the real work of trying to bring the safest products to market is really hard. And we mm -hmm. find that even in the clean beauty industry, um, people enter into it thinking, oh, I'm just going to ban these ingredients, tell my manufacturers to ban these ingredients. And that's the end of the story. And that's actually just when the work really begins. Um, but I think, I think a lot of brands are afraid to tell a story to a consumer that is messy um, transparency is scary. So saying we don't have all the answers or yes, some contaminants are a problem. Um, but let me tell you what we're working to do to try to address it. I think is maybe not everyone has the, not all brands have the appetite for doing that. The good news is, is that today's consumer, including all of us are asking really hard questions. And when you ask hard questions of companies, it forces them to act just in the same way that we're pushing and using our business voice to get Congress to act. And so um, this is a very different conversation than it was 10 years ago when people still were starting to learn about this issue. Obviously, there's still millions of American families that don't have access to this really important information. Um, but the more consumers can push the marketplace and demand more of companies, the more it's going to force our hand while we collectively work to fix a system which can be through policy. Okay, great. Um, is there any type of directory um, that would list toxic chemicals in uh, these products that um, people could have access to. So if they were to go and purchase, they say, well, I could look and see, oh, this is really bad, et cetera. What can we do to really promote more education on this issue? If I could just jump in, I would say, that I think that's what this bill, the S3331 uh, law that we're working to get passed would really help with, right? Excellent. Because you know, there are some um, nonprofits that have gone out and started doing testing and there's, you know, a variety of different like little databases. But I think that what we're pushing for here in New York, the combination of both the ingredients and when they're on a hazard list is what really gives consumers the, the power and also really illuminates what different the differences between companies so that we can have those hard conversations. Uh, we have quite a few people from different organizations with us today, and I'm just wondering uh, how can we mobilize uh, these participants as far as maybe with a sign on letter, et cetera, to really give more uh, credibility and force what we're trying to do. Yeah, I think that there's certainly we will be in touch with y'all afterwards um, and uh, hope that we can find productive ways to collaborate. Um, we generally collect up a list of folks that are endorsing our policies and would be delighted to add your organizations to the list that we mm -hmm. share with legislators as we go and meet with them. Our New York, just for folks who don't obsessively follow New York state politics like I do, um, our legislature starts in January. Um, and so that's when the energy is really going to kick up for this issue again. Um, I'll also add, um, Mari, that yes. if folks are here, um, you know, as representing themselves or even maybe an organization, um, you can join We Act Beauty Inside Out. We Excellent. have a working group. So it's a good place to also um, like build a lot of knowledge and skills for advocacy that then um, ideally then you can use to do work with the Just Green Partnership and you know other similar organizations that are doing, you know, going and talking to legislators and, and working on that. So it's a good, it's a good kind of pathway for people who are just getting started. Okay, great, excellent, excellent. I, I'll also just add something since um, Bobby was talking about legislation, 
there is another bill, and I'm not sure the bill numbers that you were talking about, um, but there are two bills in that have been passed by the um, Assembly and the Senate. It's Assembly um, 126A and, Assem and Senate Bill 1759, which actually um, uh, require, what would require um, the emerging contaminants list to be expanded to include PFAS uh, chemicals, but not individual chemicals, but to um, uh, list them as a class of chemicals because there are thousands of them. And one of the, uh, you know, chemists for these organizations are very smart. And if you just say, you know, the bill that has these ingredients or these components, all they have to do is tweak the formula. So then it doesn't fall under that um, same mm -hmm. uh, umbrella or that, you know, so um, that's why it needs to be, they need to be um, listed as a class of chemicals. And I knew, I do know that there's federal legislation, I don't have the bill numbers, I'm sorry, um, that is also looking to have them as a class of chemicals. Uh, I think Schumer, I don't know if Schumer is uh, the sponsor of that, but I do know that he came to Rockland County with uh, Mondaire Jones, and uh, who's the new um, assemblyman for the Spring Valley area, parts, mm -hmm. of, um, parts of Rockland County, to promote that and to bring more heightened awareness to the um, contamination. One of the reasons that it's that there is more awareness is because the former Governor Cuomo dropped the standards in New York State from uh, 70 parts per, I think it's billion, down to 10 parts. So that's why all of this is showing up now. When it was 70, then a lot of the lower levels of contamination were not out of compliance. And now that the standard has been dropped to 10 parts, then, um, then now we see a lot more of this. But the concern is that we cannot metabolize any of it. So that's the issue. Um, I actually have a list while other people were talking of things that we could do going forward. I don't know if you want it now or you want it later. Um, I think we could have that now. Oh, all righty. So I was thinking that one of the things, again, with this bill that I just uh, um, referenced, it's already been passed. And people have to understand passing a bill is one thing. The governor has to call it up to sign it. And then it becomes law. And, and it's given to an agency to promulgate rules and regulations. So that's one thing. So uh, people here need to contact the governor. And um, I don't know if we act has a, a list of all of the bills or um, Environmental New York or some of these uh, other organizations would have a complete list of the bills that deal with PFAS contamination. They have to be a two house bill. I know you referenced S3331. Bobby, I don't know if it has a companion bill. Uh, so, and so then that's another thing mm -hmm. um, to find a uh, an assembly person or a few of them to be sponsors and co-sponsors of a companion bill to that because having a one house bill, it doesn't go anywhere. You have to have it in the house and the Senate. I mean, sorry, the assembly and the Senate and then the governor can um, call it up for signature. And it's my understanding, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, the governor generally does that around the end of the year. So right now, December is very critical for that to happen. The other thing on my list was um, shop wisely. Don't buy these kinds of chemicals. Maybe we have to learn how to cook without Teflon. I burn a lot of stuff in my house because I don't have any Teflon anymore. But um, that's something that we need to make adjustments and the adjustments don't have to be onerous or difficult, but we do need to figure out how to make those adjustments. And there are also um, filtration systems that people can access that um, from the reports that I have read. Um, one of them is granulated, activated carbon filters. All right, will actually, I'm there. Um, um, filter out these PFAS chemicals, and okay. there was another one. 
ion exchange, but that I believe is more right. expensive than the GAC and um, reverse osmosis systems. And you can get those for whole house systems. I don't know the price of them, but um, those are some of the ways that we can um, protect our families as well as protect the broader community of people when we join with other organizations. And um, there's obviously a lot of lot more power in larger numbers. Okay, thank you so very much. Um, Chris, I think your line might be open. Chris Waters. To... Okay, all right. Um, Kyle, um, what are some of the uh, additional plans that are in the works for Newburg at this point? I know you have been working with Riverkeeper and some other organizations. What other kind of assistance can we possibly um, provide for you? Uh, you may have to unmute. Got that. This would probably be in regards to statewide legislation, meeting with um, um, other organizations at <clears throat> Black Vanilla, uh, local uh, uh, coffee shop. It's like a, it's a hub in, in Newburgh, a community hub. Uh, <clears throat> the people from environmental um, advocates of New York we're talking about, they're working on PFAS legislation. I think the only, at this moment, the only thing to help in that sense is the the umbrella of it all in New York State. And as uh, as was mentioned, New York State generally uh, sets the trend and the tone throughout the country. So this issue, uh, in Newburgh, uh, the funding that the, the, the airport has received has been, is, is one of a few who have done it. So Newburgh is <clears throat> it's already starting to set the tone and set, and set a trend and hopefully we can do something there. But beyond that, I think, I think beyond letting support in terms of um, maybe knowledge and, and experience, other than that, I think it just maybe help, help us help the rest of the state uh, rectify the situation. I really can't think of anything else locally um, at the moment. I'd like to ask you, uh, regarding the schools, the public schools, high schools in your area, what has the, has the Board of Education done anything as far, as far as providing support because they usually have water fountains, et cetera? Um, no, that, that hasn't been. I've actually talked to members of the school board. Uh, the one thing we're, we're looking to do as this local branch is to, to have, to help start environmental justice clubs in the junior high school and the, in the high school. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But um, having that conversation beyond that has not taken place. It's not, um, a lot of people really don't understand the, uh, <laughs> the significance of what's, what's going on with PFAS. So, is uh, we we've been trying to really be more um, informative about that, but then the only the only thing we we can do within with the, the only way the school board can help us is we're looking to tie mentorship in with uh, environmental justice concerns. So is, we, we're trying to marry those two. I, I would say our branch, uh, one of our three main concerns, two of them is environmental justice and mentorship to really service. Newburgh. So that's the only thing the school board can do. They, the other part of that question, they know we, they don't. <clears throat> that, that hasn't been a, a, on the on the discussion board yet. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, Ms. Jessel, um, I just need to know, could you name some of the ingredients and explain why they are so detrimental that we are finding an abundance in some of the um, care products? Yeah, so um, it really ranges. Um, one example that I had uh, named was talc, talcum powder. Um, that is a, an incredibly harmful substance, it turns out, based on a lot of peer-reviewed research, and it's carcinogenic. So that's that's one impact. Um, you have mercury, and, mercury, which I mentioned is in skin lightening creams and a lot of other cosmetics when it shouldn't be. And that I believe has impacts on your neurological system um, and maybe its reproductive system as well. Someone correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, that's another example. A lot of these um, toxic chemicals like phthalates, for example, are hormone disruptors, or endocrine disruptors, which means they mess with your hormones, which can lead to things like breast cancer, for example. Um, so again, like something that Bobby had mentioned is um, that the big concern is the cumulative impacts of, of these chemicals and getting exposed to these chemicals from a lot of different sources. We talked about how PFAS um, which is Teflon is in um, your cooking, in your pans, your nonstick pans, but it's also in your raincoats and it's also in mm -hmm. your um, cosmetics. And so, you know, you put all of those exposures together and then you're getting an, an exposure to a, a chemical that does hurt multiple um, systems in your body. So those are just some examples, but there's a very, very, very long list um, of chemicals that are toxic. Um, another one is lead. We talk about that one a lot, and that is found in beauty products. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the examples that I had on my screen was uh, a lot of lipsticks have lead in them, um, which is really scary because it's going directly on your mouth. You're, you're pretty much directly eating lead. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that of course has um, major impacts particularly for children when it comes to um, their development, but it also does impact adults and it, it has been connected to, um, to yeah, health impacts for adults as well. So that's, that's some list, but there's, there's really hundreds of chemicals that do impact your body, but a lot of them um, are carcinogenic, hurt your respiratory system, um, your nervous system, um, your uh, endocrine system, or um, cause cancers. So those are some of the, the big health impacts. Um, could some of our panelists provide uh, any company or organization that is producing um, organic non-GMO type of cosmetics? Um, well, I would throw out Beauty Counter, obviously. I know, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but the other thing I would refer to is we started what we call the Counteract Coalition, which is what other people would see as us convening our competitors. But um, it's a list that's on our website. I'll put it in the chat. The Counteract Coalition is 30 other leading clean beauty brands who have locked arms with us to have a unified voice on Capitol Hill. Um, and so we come from this from a non-competitive space to say that we may not be the brand for you, but certainly someone within our coalition hopefully is as well. So um, check that out. And you can also check out the Skin Deep database, which um, helps rank products and helps consumers understand not every brand is in there, but it helps at least give you a little bit of a baseline um, to start to shop the market safely. Mm -hmm. And where can, how can we um, purchase some of your products? BeautyConnor.com. Okay. All right. Could you just explain a little bit about what you offer? Sure. We, we have a wide product assortment, um, everything from sunscreen to body care products like shampoos and body washes, um, makeup and um, a men's line as well. So we try to, we aren't going to get too much wider than that. The goal is to meet the needs of um, consumers now with as many products as we can. So we have about 120 products now. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Okay. Hey. Are there any questions um, from uh, we have a question from the floor. Uh, from, 
from the chat and it's from Annabelle. Uh, what is the importance of this issue to healthcare, nursing, and public policy? That's quite a bit. Who would like to take that? Donald, do you want to speak to that or you want me to give a go? I think you can go ahead and I'll add. Awesome. Um, so in terms of uh, the impact for healthcare, um, there are a couple of different impacts. One is that um, we know that harmful chemicals are actually used in the healthcare system, um, unfortunately, like um, vinyl uh, IV bags and tubing can contain hormone disruptors called phthalates. Um, and so uh, healthcare workers can be highly exposed and we can be um, exposed when we're going in to get treatment to be better. Um, and so there's a whole movement called Healthcare Without Harm that's actually tackling this challenge. Um, but the, and I'm sure, any, I'm sure that there are a number of instances where PFAS is being used in those settings as well, unfortunately, because it's so widely um, used. Um, but I think that sort of on the, the um, care side of things, a lot of what for Clean and Healthy New York, our work is, is focused on making it so people don't get sick to begin with wherever possible. And that's why we want to make toxic chemicals unthinkable. And I think for, for nurses and for the healthcare um, industry as a whole, you know, prevention is you know, to use the old adage, worth a pound of cure. And where we can make changes in the products that we are exposed to, to what's being dumped into our environment on a daily basis, all of those different things help prevent disease. So we don't have the tragedies of families fighting childhood cancer. We don't have the costs to families for lost wages when they can't work because of a health ailment. Um, you don't have the educational burden when you have um, children with learning and developmental disabilities that need that extra support to be able to do well in school. Um, you don't have the burden on the healthcare system where people need to go and seek treatment. Um, preventing all of these problems is far better. Um, and so I think that that's uh, critical. And I think public policy, I mean, you heard from Lindsay about how difficult it is for uh, even the best of intentioned uh, companies to solve these problems on their own. And I think that public policy plays a critical role in driving prevention and driving toxics reduction um, because when you have the legal backing, you can actually drive change in ways that, um, you know, we need to have the leaders of the companies out there working to do better um, to, to point to, but we also need policy to come behind and really lift us all up. Um, and I think that when policy is done well, that's what it can do. We know that there are lots of times it's failed and we know the system currently is deeply embedded in racism, but we can make changes to have public policy actually work in our favor. Okay, I'd like thank to you. Add just one small comment on this because we talk Please, about go ahead. protection. Okay, I'm sorry. We, we talk about the protection of children and it's a neurotoxin. And one of the things that people need to be mindful of is when you impact um, children, that's a lifelong commitment to deal with someone who cannot, um, their brain has not fully developed or function. And I always say probably everybody's got someone in their family who has some kind of a learning challenge, a developmental disability, you know, cousin, second cousin, somewhere down the road, grandmother and aunt or great aunt or someone. And um, in the old days, um, they used to have them in the back room of the house and they just stayed there sort of alone and by themselves. And now we try to do a lot more integration of people with different kinds of abilities. Um, we, we changed how we educate people in higher education so that it's more accommodating for people like this, but it is a lifelong challenge for that family. And heaven forbid you have numerous people in, the, in your family with these um, health challenges. Someone has to take care of them. And if it's not other family members, then it's um, non-profits or government organizations that have to house and educate and feed and clothe. So it really is 
of the highest importance to protect children for all of us, but particularly children because they're um, ingesting or inhaling or ingesting these uh, this particular class of chemicals as their brains are developing. And it could short circuit mm -hmm. that development um, of their neurological system. That's one thing. And there's something that in one of the reports I was reading, I just have to add this. It's um, again, the uh, environmental science and technology letters is the Yale um, journal that I was uh, reading. And the, there was a report about PFAS in cosmetics, and it said lipstick wearers may inadvertently eat several pounds of lipstick in their lifetimes. And mm. we don't think about that because you lick your lips constantly, whether you have um, lipstick on or not. So you're actually eating it. And I just highlighted that particular um, line because it just never occurred to me that you do that and you lick your lips and you're actually ingesting all of these chemicals. That's all, I wanted to add that as well. I think that was very important and I'd like to thank you. Uh, we're getting really close to the end of this wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, and on behalf of the NAACP New York State Conference, I really like to thank you as well. Uh, I'd like to thank all the participants. It's been really, really, I feel, a very, very powerful and informative evening. So um, this is Mari De Silva, Chair of the Environmental and Climate Justice Committee, and I will turn this over to Paul. I thank you, Mari. And uh, we wanna thank everyone for uh, their participation tonight. Uh, Gabby, if you can put up the information on how folks can contact the NAACP uh, Just Green Partnership, uh, We Act, and of course us over here at Clean and Healthy New York. And we hope and expect to be doing more webinars like this uh, with our coalition partners uh, through the years to uh, make sure that we get the bills that were mentioned by uh, our leaders here today, uh, Bobby, uh, uh, Natalie, and, and, and Sonal, uh, that need to be a part of the push to fight for environmental justice. And uh, we just want to thank everybody and uh, hope you have a wonderful holiday season. And we will uh, be seeing you uh, in, in January with the State of the State. Can hey, I say Barry? one thing? Sure. Can I just want to thank Gabby and, and I believe the gentleman's name is Greg for the outstanding work and as far as being our technical um, technicians uh, this evening. So thank you so very much. And I will say uh, good night to everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for participating. Happy I holidays. Bye. Bye bye.